Potential is dormant ability, unused success. It's everything that you can be, but you have not yet become. It's everything that you can do, but have not yet done. Potential has no retirement plan. I don't care if you've been in the same role for 30 years. If you're still in a role, there's still more purpose for you to do. If you're just getting started, you're not limited because you're just getting started. You still have the opportunity, the potential to do so much more. And the reason we need you to do it, because it isn't just about you. As you change and transform, you influence and impact so many others. Don't look anybody in the face. <laughs> Kale starts taking off his watch. <laughs> Guys are taking off their necklaces and putting it in their pockets. Because the four of us are walking down the stairs like this, not looking at anybody. There's barely anybody down there, but the four of us are standing right next to each other, like this. Because we don't want anybody to rob us. <laughs> So I encourage leaders to do what all the time? Find out how your people are doing. Find out how you're doing. How am I doing leading you right now? How am I doing with giving you clarity? How am I doing with you knowing what the objectives are? We need more leaders creating an environment, creating the right emotions where peak performance can take place. And it's very important as leaders that we're spending no time posing, being professional posers that I want to look the part. We want to authentically be the part. And when we are the part, it makes a difference. This is why I'm telling you, the individuals who are always at the top of their game and they stay at the top of the game are the ones you need to spend time talking with. I ask groups every time, everyone who wants to be at the best of, uh, of what they do, I said, hey, look, do you know who your top salespeople are in your group? Most people say yes. I says, when's the last time you gave them a phone call? When's the last time you had lunch with them? When's the last time you went and specifically spent time with them? Don't do like I did. See, when I was playing in NFL, I was playing with the New York Jets. I had a teammate of mine named Paul Wilson. I was number 18. At the time, he was number 89. And here's what we did. Every time you looked at the sideline, you saw 1,889 or 8,918. And we were standing right next to each other. And isn't it funny that two guys who weren't playing found each other? And what did we do when we found each other? Complain about why we weren't on the field. <laughs> now, you would think we would spend time with, you know, I should have been standing as often as possible next to number 80 and 81 and 82 and number 88. I should have been spending more time with Altoon. I should have been spending more time with the guys who were getting it done. No, I, had a I talked about those guys, but I spent time with people just like me. Is this making sense? But here's the thing I know. There are times when I want to run around the wedge and not have those conversations. There are times when I want to run around the wedge and not have that conversation with my wife. There are times when I want to run around the wedge and not have those courageous, difficult conversations with my team. There are times when I want to run around the wedge and not have to make these tough decisions. But when I run around the wedge, okay, when I don't run through it, when I don't run through it, the consequences aren't just on me. They're on so many others as well. And you all know this, and I'm not telling you something you don't know. I'm hoping this is just a reminder. What wedge is in front of you right now that you need to run through? Now, whatever just came to mind is it. Don't get rid of it. Don't throw it out of your mind like it didn't happen, okay? You know what I'm talking about. Either a person came to mind, a situation came to mind, a scenario came to mind. Run through it. Run through it. It's not nearly as bad as you're imagining it. That's the problem with fear. Until you confront fear, it grows. If you attack fear, it shrinks. When you run through fear, guess what? It's a, a, I had my, one of my mentors told me this. He says, Eric, remember, fear is a doorway you walk through, not a house you live in. And too often we allow, not only ourselves, but as leaders, we gotta make sure we're not letting our people live in that same place. What if, what if, what if, to the point where it causes people not to move at all? I was in Florida, I had a gentleman who was leading an organization, he says, Eric, tell my people, let them know. What happens if they don't perform well? I said, what do you mean? Tell them what happens in the NFL. When players don't perform well, when things don't go well, you know, tell them what happens. I said, are you sure you want me to tell them? He said, yes. I said, okay, they fired a coach. 
<laughs> so that's how he looked at me. I'm like, hey, you asked the question. <laughs> that's the answer, right? But I am saying that if you think about all the customers you have right now, can you picture them as simply acorns instead of full-grown oak trees? It's a little thing, but it's a huge mindset shift. The minute you start looking at all your customers and the impact and the success 3M has already had, and all of you who are on the front line creating these cells, but can you picture what you've done so far as still, there's still tons left that we can do, and can we picture it as acorns with a whole bunch of oak trees still with the possibility of growing? Now, the reason this is so powerful, you start looking at current customers even differently. You start looking at what other things can we do with it? How much more can we expand this? How can we start playing the wind? How can we push the gas pedal down? I'm like, hey, we're up by 30, but we're still blitzing every single play. The reason people stay lifelong members in the why is because the relationship went from a transaction to a transformation. That means it engaged my heart. It engaged my mind. Emotionally, I'm bought in. And when you're emotionally bought in, even when service isn't great, even when sometimes I walk through the Y and certain things do not look at the standard I believe they should be, even though someone may not have spoken today, spoke yesterday, but didn't speak today, something must be going on. But the difference is I may be upset about it, but upset because I feel like this place belongs to me. Not upset like I need to find a different place to go. This is the, what makes the why so significant. It has such a heartfelt impact on every single person in there. So with that being said, how do we raise it to the next level? It will not be based on strategy. It will not be based on techniques. It will not be based on any of that stuff. That stuff may add value, but transformative value is gonna be when your heart's even, well, I like to say it this way, when your heart it's all in, if you know what I mean. There's no out. I'm all in. I'm going to do this because I love it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make a difference in that young person's life. And I know to do that, it's going to require some risk. I'm going to take a chance. I'm going to get out of my comfort zone. I'm going to do a few things that might cost me in terms of emotionally to make a difference in that person's life. I didn't tell you, how do I get rid of the fear of the unknown? I just said, how do you get rid of the fear? Uncertainty, failure, rejection are just part of success. You don't get rid of those. Every single time you make a transformation, you're gonna have to face those again. I have my daughter with me in Las Vegas. I'm keynoting, probably 3,000 people there, a great time. Took her there for her 16th birthday. We went to a few of the shows. It was a great time, me and her. And I talked about, obviously it was for her birthday, so it was a special event, but I, I talked about how I date my daughters, just like this. She was sitting right on the front row. She was smiling through the whole thing, and it was great. And, you know, it feels good to have those kind of conversations. I love my girls, Taylor and Matt, love them. And after I finished, I asked Taylor, I said, baby, give me, you know, I always ask, quick question, scale of one to 10, how'd you say I did? She goes, dad, I, I would say it was great, that it was like, a, a, you know, eight and nine, eight and a half, nine. I was like, one to 10? I mean, man, people stood up and clapped. One to 10, she goes, oh, oh no, dad, it was, I said, no, tell me why it wasn't a 10. She said, well, it, it would have been a, a 10, but you, you were talking about how you love taking me on dates and, you know, every month and everything. I was like, yeah. She goes, dad, you haven't taken me a date in six months. Whew. I'm still, telling stories, talking about my values, but I'm talking about something I haven't been consistently practicing, inconsistency. Now, even if it's unintentional, hypocrisy is frowned upon everywhere. And so making ourselves as leaders vulnerable enough to receive feedback, so being an authentic leader, it's very important, but it's also important to be a vulnerable leader, willing to receive feedback. But you also have to decide, what's the one thing you're going to do when you leave here? I'm telling you, I've heard a lot of great halftime locker room speeches in my time. 
But I also know there's a lot of time we just went out in the second half and just made the same mistakes faster. Sometimes there needs to be an adjustment. We need to decide what are we going to do differently.